Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. The Jesse Blake Sports Report. Really? Oh, wait, really? The Jesse Blake Sports Report. That's it? Don't forget, it's the Jesse Blake Sports Report with Jesse Blake. <laughs> you know, that's kind of redundant. Dude, is there a problem? You know, it's fine. I, I just, you know, I thought maybe you guys would come up with something, you know, good. Man, I can just read it. You know what? Doesn't matter to me. I get paid by the word. <sighs> Let's do this. The Jesse Blake Sports Report with Jesse Blake. Powered by Sports Interaction. Canada's Sportsbook. Today's episode of the Jesse Blake Sports Report brought to you by Jesse Blake. I am Jesse Blake hosting the show. The Jesse Blake Sports Report is brought to you by Doer. Doer stands for natural performance and simplicity. And they make the world's most comfortable pants. I own a pair of Doer jeans that I can confirm that they are the world's most comfortable pants. I have been treating my butt very well lately. And you can too. If you go to Doer.ca, that's D-U-E-R.ca. And you get 15% off of your purchase by using the code SDPN. They don't only sell pants. They also have uh, beanies and polos and t-shirts actually have a polo as well. The polo is very soft. I can confirm. They have shorts. If you want a shorter version of the world's most comfortable pants, they have shorts. So go to doer.ca, use that code SDPN. You'll get 15% off of your purchase and enjoy their wonderfully soft clothes. Today, it is my pleasure to be joined by Andrew Berkshire, the head honcho of Game Over, the host of Game Over Montreal, and now the host of Game Over Cup Final for some episodes. Not all for episodes, some. Andrew. <laughs> I mean, I if it was all episodes, I feel like I'd be hoarding it. You know what I mean? Like, I could do it. It'd be fine. Mm-hmm. But I want to get our other hosts in there as well. And Harnish Arm and Armand are going to do game three. And then Peter and Audi are going to do a couple games as well. So nice. it's going to be fun. Yeah, you got to share the wealth of this big moment of Colorado, Tampa. And you're wearing a jersey for everybody listening. What jersey are you wearing? I am wearing a Quebec Nordiques uh, Joe Sackick jersey that my wife got me for my 18th birthday. What? Yeah. Oh my gosh. And how long have you guys been together? Since we were 16. Wow. I had no I didn't know that. Yeah, we've been together for a very very long time. 2003. Wow, you beat uh Steve and uh Mrs. Dangle. I know, right? <laughs> by by the like longest barely. relationship in the SDPN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, long you should get some sort of award for that. For sure. Yeah. At the draft, we'll present an award for the longest relationship, longest beard, you know, all sorts of weird stuff. <laughs> like that episode of The Office, uh, the Dundies. <laughs> the Dundies. <laughs> we should do it. Do we have Although, our- yeah. I have to give you credit, Jesse. I was made aware of something by Julian. We got to give you an award for the best straddling of both sides, because I heard that well, you said that the Florida Panthers were not a legitimate contender. <laughs> Before you made your expert picks in your bracket challenge, saying that they were not a legitimate contender because they won the president's trophy. And then when you look at the bracket challenge, who does Jesse pick to go to the Stanley Cup final? The Florida Panthers. Andrew, you are allowed to change your mind once you get more information. I made the bracket pick before I dug into that episode that I did with Julian, where we were doing pretenders and contenders for the playoffs. And afterwards after i had picked my bracket i decided that i didn't like florida anymore so (laughs) after they were eliminated (laughs) no it was before they were eliminated check the date on that episode it was before they were eliminated anyways stop stop hating uh what's what's (laughs) i love it (laughs) okay what's the uh what's the percentage of the quebec population that's still upset over the nordiques oh can't well i mean can't be super high because Almost half of the population of Quebec lives in the metro area of Montreal, right? It's Mm. like three and a half to four million. So I think there's only about eight million people in Quebec. But Quebec City, maybe there's some strongholds. But I think a lot of people at this point have pretty much moved on to be Montreal Canadiens fans or some of them transitioned into being Bruins fans. But there's always going to be some diehards. I think when that new arena was built in Quebec City, it kind of came back. 
but now like if you were to go to the bell center or it would have been the forum back then in nordique's jersey you would get like beat up but nowadays people are like nice jersey man okay because like uh there are the two cups the avalanche one in the 90s i assume there's some saltiness still left over oh, then but i mean they won the next year after they moved uh, yeah that's gotta hurt that was that was their team like nordic yep. fans that was their team and they won the stanley cup they knew they were close too but if they stayed in quebec there's no way they get patrick wall hmm. that's fair yeah and uh so like now I assume this cup final, we see Colorado, Tampa. There's not really a whole bunch of people sitting at their TV in Quebec being like, ah, that's that's our team, you know? No, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think that that time has passed. Everybody who was involved in the move is gone. Although uh, one of the people who was instrumental in it, I believe still works for like uh, Olympics Canada. Oh, wow. So he, he's not very well loved, we'll say. <laughs> By a certain segment of the Canadian population. Yes, 100%. <laughs> All right, let's get to the main topic of what we want to talk about today. The top five vacant NHL head coaching positions and who will fill them. So we're going to start with an honorable mention because there's actually six vacant positions and one was filled. The Vegas Golden Knights hired Bruce Cassidy. Andrew, what do you think about the hiring? Is it a good decision? Uh, what do you think about him being let go by Boston and then being available to be signed by Vegas? I think Boston is tanking for Bedard. I mean, they're they, they're probably going to lose Bergeron either to retirement or somewhere else. Uh -huh. Marshawn is out until 2023 for sure. Has double hip surgery. Might never be the same in his mid thirties now. And then McAvoy's out until 2023 as well. They're going to have a rough start to the season, right? They lost Krejci a year ago and replaced him with Eric Halla. I don't think Boston is in their competitive window anymore. And now they've fired a really good coach. I think they want their shot at one of those top players in the next draft. But as far as Bruce Cassidy goes for Vegas, I think it's absolutely brilliant. This is a guy who just took over, or I guess not just, but his last spot, he took over from a very structure oriented coach in Claude Julien, who wasn't getting the offense out of his team that you needed to get out of in order to like make a difference in the playoffs and immediately the Boston Bruins created a lot more offense for his entire tenure. The worst he finished in a single season in terms of uh, how well his team controlled play at even strength was seventh hmm. in his five years as head coach, five full years. That's pretty amazing. And then Vegas, a team highly structured, but doesn't generate enough offense. I think it's a perfect fit. I think they're going to have a great season next year. We're gonna we're gonna go back to the very beginning about <laughs> you saying Boston is tanking for Bedard. You think that's, that's what I'm the saying? With them, they have pasta. Like, so is pasta's on the move because that's the rumor. So you think that, like he's out the door? Right. I don't know if they're gonna trade him this year, but if they man, if they actually trade David Pasternak, they're, first of all, they're gonna get like the craziest package mm -hmm. in any trade that we've seen in recent years. But. Uh, I, even with, if they kept past the next year, like they just don't have many good players with like losing Bergeron and Marshawn and McAvoy. Mm -hmm. That's one, two and three on their on their top players list. I like pasta, but he's not as good as those three. So I don't know. I just don't see how they can compete, especially after losing Rask. And you know, like their goalies were OK last year. I don't think they were difference makers. Swayman was all right. He was all right, yeah. but all he's got some work to do as well. Allmark had yeah, a Allmark struggled in the playoffs, though. He did. He did. And, like, I, I understand your concerns because I just pulled up the roster here. And, like, you're asking Taylor Hall and Charlie Coyle and Jake DeBrusque and, and Craig Smith to hold down the fort while all of your stars are out for months at a time. And it's quite a task. And especially if you look at the division they're in as well, there's no there are no real off nights, you know? No. Uh, it's, it's such a tough division because it's so top-heavy. And we expect uh, a team like Ottawa to try and get better. Probably Buffalo and Montreal are going to stick to the bottom. But it's going to be so competitive when you're facing Tampa and Florida and Toronto night after night after night. So yeah, 100%. And who's better at tanking than Taylor Hall? <laughs> he knows how to be on teams that get high picks. To get number one picks. He's a, <laughs> what, four or five time lottery winner? I think four. Because he didn't Buffalo win when they had him. I know they traded him, but they won that year. Is that his year with Buffalo? 
pretty sure it was the Owen Power year. The 2020-2021 season is... So it would be the 2021 draft, I guess. And that was that was Owen Power. That was yeah, Owen Power. So technically, first overall. Yeah, if you count towards his end of the tenure when they picked up Owen Power, then he's got four. Yep. He's I mean, big. he doesn't he doesn't count himself, but uh-huh. he got McDavid, <laughs> Nugent Hopkins, Yakupov, Nico Hishier, and now Owen Power. It's the power of Taylor Hall. <laughs> Boston Bruins are getting Connor Bedard. You heard it here first. I'm holding you to this. That one year from now, because it's going to be about the draft time next year when we're back on the regular schedule. We're checking it. We're playing this clip, and we're seeing if you're right. <laughs> oh, God. I hope I'm not. I don't want Boston to have Connor Bedard. All right. Let's get to the actual top five list. Honorable mention goes to Vegas for actually completing a signing here and uh, getting Bruce Cassidy as a head coach. Number five on the top five vacant NHL head coaching jobs and who will fill them. The Philadelphia Flyers are at number five. And it looks like they will fill their coaching position with John Tortorella. He's going to move from the TNT booth back to the bench and coach the Flyers. They are currently, uh, according to the most recent reports, they're discussing the contract and the length and the money terms. What do you think about the hiring, Andrew Berkshire? I can't say I love it. I understand it in that I feel like the Philadelphia Flyers have kind of gotten away from their identity. They don't really have one. So if they want to bring back the whole Broad Street Bullies mentality and play like that lunch pail hockey, I think Torts is actually a great fit especially if you're envisioning the Flyers being competitive like three or four years from now, and then you can just ax him right before that and bring in a coach who you know will believe in the players and be like the nice guy that gets them to the next uh, level after the hard ass leaves. I feel like Torts could fill that gap, mm-hmm. but as a long-term thing, like he never works long-term. Mm-hmm. He's, just, he's just not fun to be around. And I know that like players like him, to a certain extent because he's honest about stuff, but just some of his comments this year, I'm surprised that he's back in the league at all. Like uh, when he was talking about how Trevor Zegras was like bad for the game because he's hot dogging and stuff. Like, do we really need people like torts? Haven't we evolved past the need for the guy who thinks that high skilled plays are bad and you need to punch skilled players in the face. (laughs) The one interesting thing though, is torts versus Sidney Crosby again in the same division. Does Brandon Dubinsky come out of retirement to slash Sidney Crosby in the face once more? I'm going to say no. It, no, it, it doesn't happen. Too injured. But it's, it's great, great reference. <laughs> Terrific memory. Um, so the one thing about Torts, uh, our colleague Adam Wilde agreed with you when he was breaking down this. And he said he's a three-year coach. You know, like is exactly kind of what you said. It's he he has his time. He gets everybody fired up and then they kind of move on. And with the Flyers organization, with the amount of change that it looks like they're going to have over the next couple of years, it looks like nobody who's in the organization now is long for the organization. I don't think from GM to president down that everybody's going to be there. The players especially, you know, because they need so much turnover. So Tort seems like a great fit for now. I think it'll get everybody motivated, but for long term, I don't think anybody really sticks around in that organization. Yeah, I, I think the Torts hire is strictly about like building an identity as a team, mm-hmm. getting back to Flyers hockey, and then once he wears out his welcome, they'll bring in like a younger coach who can innovate a little bit. Yeah, and he can do that. You know, like he can he can get a team to play a certain way. So 100%. I don't hate the signing at all. Number four on the list. Uh, a team that will Philadelphia, their number one pick was Barry Trotz. And number four on our list is the Winnipeg Jets, who it looks like they're going to get Barry Trotz if his plan to go to Nashville with his new house that he just purchased the other day and become uh, upper management there doesn't come to fruition. It looks like Barry Trotz will sign in Winnipeg. Do you think that he is going to fill that vacant position, Andrew? I mean, it makes sense, right? It'd be going home for him. And there definitely is an avenue in Winnipeg for Trotz moving up into management. I feel like Kevin Sheveldayoff just can't last that much longer Mm -hmm. because let's face it, he hasn't done that much of a great job in Winnipeg. They had like that short spurt where they were a really competitive team and then everything fell apart on them. So I think it makes sense. But what you mentioned about Nashville, 
that probably makes more sense because David Boyle is not only long tenured, but also quite old and he might be looking to retire. So if Trotz can go back to where it all started for him in the NHL, that might be even more attractive than uh, going back home to Winnipeg. And I mean, no offense to Winnipeg, but Winnipeg versus Nashville. (laughs) I feel like if you're looking at which city you want to live in, you're probably not picking Winnipeg. Right. Like, that's why a lot of people were uh, paying attention to the rumor that, well, not the rumor, the confirmed report that he bought a house in Nashville on uh, Wednesday of this week. Because it's like, okay, either he's moving there or he got his summer home because he's going to have to live in Winnipeg during the regular season. (laughs) So there's people on both sides of the what does the house mean? And I could I I understand the summer home thing because like you're saying it's probably not a, he probably doesn't want to settle down all year in, in Nashville and he probably or in Winnipeg and he wants that option in Nashville and also uh, came out yesterday from uh, Crossing Broad the Flyers when they were going after Trotz they offered him a blank check which and yep. they reported that it was near seven million dollars which would make him the highest paid coach ever in the history of National Hockey League. Is Trotz worth $7 million? Like, And he's turning it down for better opportunities, I guess, in Winnipeg or Nashville. Yeah, I mean, I, if I were the Philadelphia Flyers, how insulted would I be that <laughs> he turned down the richest contract ever to yeah. go to two teams that aren't really in a competitive window, right? That's right. the two teams that are, that are competing for him. I think Trotz is worth that if you have the ability to build something that could be a contender right away because... Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's necessarily the best development coach, but he is a guy who can take a veteran roster to the next level and have them play like the most utterly committed hockey possible. And he can play a boring style like he did in the New York Islanders, or he can play a more high tempo, exciting style like he had the Washington Capitals play when they won the Stanley Cup. So I think a lot of people see him as just a defensive coach, but I think he coaches quite effectively based on the roster that he has. Probably one of the best coaches in the league for the last like 20, 30 years, he's, I mean, who knows? Are our coaches worth that in general? There's no salary cap for coaches. So <laughs> it's true. May as well. Right. If, if it's that or torts, I think I'd go with Barry Trotz. Right. And like for him, I guess it's at this point, he doesn't need the money. You know, it's about fit. So I don't blame him, I guess, for turning down $7 million, but it's still a lot of money. It's hard to turn that down. Plus, Philadelphia is a cool city, too. Yeah, it couldn't hurt. For $7 million, any place is a cool city. All right, number three. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> number three on the list, uh, vacant coaching positions, Dallas Stars. Now, there's been a couple rumors, and I have my name about who I think. I got two names about who I think is going to fill this job, the Dallas Stars coaching head coaching job. Andrew, I want to get yours and see if they match up with mine. All right. The one name that keeps coming up to me just because the Dallas Stars seem to want to compete right now is Peter DeBoer, barely going that far from Vegas to Dallas. I think he has a long history of success, especially right after he takes over a team. He's had some big playoff runs in, I believe, uh, New Jersey, where they went to the cup final in San Jose. They went to the cup final and in Vegas, the conference final. So he's a candidate that I think would fit in really well with Dallas's style, but I don't know if I necessarily like it because I'd like to see Dallas switch it up a little bit after playing such a boring defensive style. But he he seems like the one that makes the most sense to me. Yeah, uh, no, that's that's who was number one on my list as well. Um, The two Stanley Cup finals and the five conference finals in 10 years. I think Dallas. That's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Like, the guy, he wins, you know? And I think Dallas looks at that and they say, okay, our window's right now because of all of our players are aging. And we're getting a little younger. Like, um, like they're, the forward group that really stepped up this year and, and got them to the playoffs is, is in their uh, earlier 20s. But we're trying to win now. And I think Pete DeBoer is the guy if, they're, if that's their mentality of how they want to take on this season. Another guy I thought, like, under the radar, like, Pete DeBoer is my number one pick of who's going to fill that. But under the radar, I think Travis Green has a shot as well. Uh, He spent a long time in Vancouver, and he needs a second shot in the NHL. And I feel like um, Dallas could be the place. Like, there's a roster that 
Uh, it's not it's not too similar to Vancouver's, but it's the makeup. I don't disagree with how they play. You know, I feel like he, Travis Green on a second stint around the NHL could be a very good head coach. Yeah, I know Travis Green was pretty well respected around the league as well when he was in Vancouver. I, I don't know how much of that was warranted just based on how much better they were immediately after Bruce Boudreaux took over <laughs> and how the, the Canucks just like they they never had the good underlying stats you want to see from a team that's actually competitive, right? I know they had that one little playoff run, but that was mostly Thatcher Demko and some timely scoring, right? Mm -hmm. But that was his first stop. Coaches learn a lot on the job. And let's face it, the Vancouver Canucks didn't have the best roster either. And Bruce Boudreaux is a fantastic coach, especially in the regular season. Mm -hmm. I I, I hate... It sucks for Travis Green, like when somebody comes in and they're like, "Oh, I have the exact same pieces, and look what I did." But look, I, imagine Dominic Ducharme. Oh my gosh! Oh, that's yeah, that's brutal situation. Like I feel bad for the guys, but like they need another shot eventually. I I hope in some capacity, if it's assistant coach or a head coaching gig. Uh, number two on the list. I'm gonna get your your guess here as well before I give mine. The Boston Bruins. Vacant head coaching position. Who fills it? Yeah, I've seen Jim Montgomery keeps on coming up for this. And I know that uh, Elliot Freeman brought him up along with Jay Leach, who was in the NHL not too long ago. I remember the Canadians picking him up as like a fl- like a depth defenseman way back in the day. And uh, one name that I keep on seeing as well is Joe Sacco, which, oh, you know, Definitely makes me think of the Bruins. I don't even remember where he played throughout his career, but I definitely have a Joe Sacco hockey card somewhere in my hockey card collection. (laughs) And the Bruins do love their former players. Okay, yeah, he was never a Boston Bruin. He was a a Maple Leaf, a Mighty Duck, an Islander, a Capital, and a Flyer. Mm -hmm. But Joe Sacco, he's from Massachusetts. It's a very Bruins name, is it not? And I feel like the Bruins love the Bruins names. Yeah, it's a it's a rough and tumble kind of guy, you know. It yeah. feels like he'd fit the Boston mentality. And I don't know where Jim Montgomery is from, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he's from Massachusetts as well. No, he's from Montreal. Okay, never mind. Okay, he's a Montrealer. Yeah, um, they do like their Montrealers down there. They do. Yeah, long his Bergeron. Yeah, I mean he's more close to Quebec, but yeah, they love Quebecers uh, in Boston for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jim Montgomery seems like a great fit because <laughs> so there the, somebody during uh so sinbin vegas they did this thing where they they outlined his coaching style from back in the his ncaa days and it feels so boston so so jim mcgarty gave an interview and they're like okay what's your process to winning hockey games and he said i have a seven step process it's 50 hits in a game win 60 (laughs) percent of face-offs give up three or four odd man rushes commit to blocking shots, win the special teams battle, win the net front battle, take zero undisciplined penalties. He said if the team does four of those, they'll probably win. If they do five, it'll uh, be a lopsided win in their favor. And I feel like when he's starting off with do 50 hits in a game, (laughs) that's who Boston wants, right? Definitely. But whoever gets 50 hits in a game. (laughs) Team hits, right? 50 team hits. That's the goal. That's wild. That's the goal, you guys. And like after his his, his outing in uh, Dallas because of alcoholism, which he's been very open about and uh, speaking about his recovery and entering rehab and all that. He's taken the position as assistant coach on the St. Louis Blues uh, uh, coaching bench, and apparently he's been like very well received, and he's he's come back and he's been recovered, and so I'm very happy that he he's in a new position to take on probably another head coaching gig here, and it just feels like Boston is the right fit. Yeah, it does seem like a good fit, and mm-hmm. from what I remember hearing when he was head coach of the Stars, like the players really did like him. Uh, they they felt he's a player's coach, right? And you heard uh, Sweeney talking in their press conference when they talked about firing Bruce Cassidy that he was saying like the communication wasn't always perfect and that there was maybe a block between what uh, uh, Cassidy was saying and what the players were receiving, which personally I find is probably complete BS just because the results for Boston are so strong. And if the coaching message isn't getting through, you're probably not getting amazing results every game. But uh, if Jim Montgomery is going to make their players happy, especially if they do like a little short rebuild here or retool, 
that's something that's really valuable. And his record with the stars was solid. Oh yeah. They weren't amazing, but uh, they probably would have made the playoffs both years. He was there. Uh, they made it in the first round or first, first year. And then he uh, took his leave in the second season that he was there. Yeah, you saying like his record with the stars was amazing. It's just looking at the list. Like we have really good teams that don't have a coach. You know, yep. it's kind of weird this year where it's like, oh, these teams are actually kind of decent and whoever hops in is probably going to go on a decent playoff run. And it's not like, hey, all of these are bottom five teams who are missing head coaches. Yeah, 100 percent. There's like some serious teams either on the rise, like the Red Wings or teams that maybe want to eke out another couple runs mm -hmm. while they have their core players in like Boston or Dallas or if Boston's tanking, I don't know, or teams that want to be into that competitive window like the Winnipeg Jets and Philadelphia Flyers that are highly questionable, but uh, good good on them for trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you mentioned the number one team on this list, the team most on the rise, I think, across the National Hockey League, the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, Steve Eiserman is looking for a new head coach. Who do you think it will be? I don't think it will be this person, but I would live for it because it would be extremely funny if Mike Babcock <laughs> went back to the Detroit Red Wings. <laughs> he coached Steve Eiserman. Oh I my God. They could never. No, there's no way. They could right? Because the players hated him in the end. They had uh, Nick Lindstrom's part of the organization. Uh, Iserman's part of the organization. The the guy that would be the most fun though is Sergei Fedorov. Yeah. Like I saw you guys talking about him on the SDP as well. I love the pulling the goalie in overtime thing. It's so insane. The fact that it worked almost every time yep. is the coolest thing. And I feel like Fedorov is one of those people who just thinks the game differently and he would bring so much fun as like a viewing experience i would love if they brought it back but at the same time it's that like how many former red wings can you fit into the organization before it looks not that smart the uh the oilers are plugging their ears right now being like you can, <laughs> every ex-oiler can be in our organization what do you mean yeah yeah um, i th you just made the thumbnail for this video by the way it's 100 percent going to be mike babcock coaching the red wings uh so thank you thank you andrew you're very welcome um spencer carberry the uh the man who's in charge of the leafs power play has been getting a lot of love uh, around the no national hockey league it was his first uh season as a uh as a guy on the bench in in the national hockey league and i think it would be an outside shot that he would get the red wings job but i think there's a chance and I think it would cause the most chaos amongst NHL Twitter if the Red Wings, if Eiserman stole the Leafs' kind of best asset on Sheldon Keefe's bench, which is Spencer Carberry, the the young 40-year-old who's kind of revamped uh, the team's special teams. And I think it'd be it'd be great chaos to see uh, the Red, Win Red Wings pick him up, go with somebody really young, somebody who kind of thinks outside the box. And it would make Leaf fans very upset. Which yeah, usually I, I can already see the Steve Simmons headline. Steve Eiserman owns Kyle Dubas. <laughs> exactly. Stats geek loses to former <laughs> NHLer. So I think because this scenario uh, accounts for maximum chaos. Besides your Mike Babcock one, uh, I think this is the second most chaos in this scenario. So I think it might happen. Spencer Carberry to the Detroit Red Wings. Yeah, one thing that I one name I forgot to mention that is probably a pretty underrated one for Dallas would be Claude Julian. Hmm. He's mentioned that he wants to get back into coaching pretty quick here, and he has a huge resume of success. So he's a guy that uh, for, for Dallas, I think would be a really good fit less so for Detroit, because I don't think he's as much of a developmental coach, but any team that wants to get into the playoff picture right away, I feel like Claude Julian would be a really good hire. Julian back to Boston. Oh God. I don't think he would go back to Boston. That would be wild, though, wouldn't it? It would be kind of wild. I mean, he went back to Montreal. Yeah. It's a larger sense. gap, though. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, the gap was like a decade. It was literally 10 years. I just pulled up the uh, record here. And it hasn't quite been 10 years since he was fired by the Bruins. Uh, that's, that's number one on my list. Those are the five open positions. 
Andrew, thank you for joining us and doing this list. It's very, it's, it's my very, pleasure. I think we got a lot of drama out of it. I think we've created a lot of fake chaos situations, which I hope come to fruition, especially the Boston Bruins getting Connor Bedard. It, you will be <laughs> held to that. I'm going to keep bringing it up constantly. Bruins get Bedard. Red Wings get Babcock. <laughs> Florida Panthers, pretenders next year, too. Next year, pretenders always. Always pretenders? Always pretenders, the Florida Panthers. <laughs> I mean, the Florida Panthers are now the poster boy for Leafs would have won, right? <laughs> it's true. No, they were the Leafs. Okay, the Leafs were one goal away. They had a real shot here. I, I will say I agree. The way the Florida Panthers played, both in the first round and the second round, watching the Leafs against the Lightning, the Leafs would have destroyed the Florida Panthers. It's not comparable. Leafs could have been in the conference finals. Sad day. Let's not relitigate that today. <laughs> Maybe on a different episode. But thank you for being here, Andrew. Host of Game Over. Catch Game Over Cup Final after every single Stanley Cup Final game. It began yesterday, and it was a very fantastic episode. Catch the next one on Saturday evening. Andrew, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Jesse. Talk to you soon. The next part of this podcast is 19+. plus. If you want to get involved in any of these bets, it is sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. We ask that you always please gamble responsibly. There are resources to helpful gambling tips in the link in the description of this episode. If you need that, please click that link. 19 plus again, sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. Surprisingly, there's been a lot of Montreal talk on the podcast today. We did a lot of Montreal talk with Andrew Berkshire, and now I'm going to continue that train because in Canada land this weekend, we have a very important event taking place, the Canadian Grand Prix. It's happening in Montreal. And this morning, Thursday morning, as I'm recording this, the FIA gave out some very interesting news. I swear this is going to lead back to a bet. <laughs> the FIA announced it is introducing a technical directive with the intention of reducing porpoising in the interests of safety. Now, what does that jumble of words mean? So the Mercedes car in particular, this season in F1, 2022 season, has been plagued by porpoising. So the car has been oscillating on the road. It's been bouncing up and down. And lately, last weekend, I should say in particular, the drivers have Lewis and Max, or Lewis and Max, Lewis and George, who don't, I'm not going to mention the him max the name that shall not be spoken um lewis and george their backs have been hurting and pierre gasly even spoke out uh, against it as well i said uh against the health concerns for for of porpoising you know it's it's hurting the drivers back ricardo as well had a little back troubles the bouncing isn't good when you're going at those top speeds the porpoising has become so extreme that the bouncing up and down has become so extreme that the drivers are starting to get hurt and the faa can't have this so they are They announced today they're implementing rules to get rid of the porpoising or at least have it only be a certain amount of bounce. This is excellent for anybody who's been following the F1 season so far, because if you're a Mercedes fan, that's kind of been their main, I don't want to call it an excuse, but their main reason for why this season has not gone the way they had hoped it was because their car is bouncing too much. So is this the turnaround that Mercedes needs? Is this where we see, okay, it's not going to be this weekend where they implement the new porpoising rules. I don't think so. At least I don't think they can get that turned around so quickly. They're all going to meet. The FA is going to meet with the teams, I believe tomorrow to implement the uh, new directives. And it'll probably be set up for the Grand Prix in the coming weeks. But does that mean Ferrari doesn't figure out their engine troubles? Red Bull doesn't figure out all of their car stalling issues? And Mercedes could now be in a place to get back into the Constructors' Championship. If I pull up the odds here on sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN, Mercedes is 41-1 to to win the Constructors' Championship. So Red Bull... Clearly the favorite. They're well ahead of the race. Ferrari's right there. 3.5 to 1. And then Mercedes, third best odds. 41 to 1. So that's 41 
times whatever you put down if Mercedes wins the Constructors' Championship. I'm holding out as a Mercedes boy. My fingers are crossed that porpoising solves it for this team, and this is the turnaround they get. It's a long season. It's a long shot, but it is a long season. And my hope is that somehow George and Lewis, they with the no longer having the back troubles and the porpoising, they find their way to a couple podiums where we get some DNFs from the Red Bull guys. The name who not shall not be spoken. Mr. V. MV. And the Ferrari guys. Hopefully we get some more DNFs. We saw. We've already seen uh, double last week. Maybe we get some more. And Mercedes finds a way to win the Constructors' Championship. That's what I'm hoping for. And that's or put a little money. Also, since we're here, why not run with the double Mercedes bet? This weekend, the Canadian Grand Prix, maybe the good news about the porpoising goes away, going away motivates George Russell. That's not really going to happen, but he's been in the top five consistently all year. He's had a couple podiums. He's looked like the best driver outside of the Red Bull and Ferrari drivers. George Russell. 25 to 1 to win the Canadian Grand Prix. If you're ever going to take a flyer on a Mercedes driver, it's probably George right now cuz Lewis has been trailing him a lot all season. Uh 25 to 1. I think that's pretty good long shot odds for him to win the Canadian Grand Prix and I'd love to see it. Uh get his first win in a Mercedes car. It'd be sweet for George. So the odds there ahead of him, Max 1.5, 1.75, Charles Leclerc 3.79, Checo 5 to 1, Signs 15 to 1, 15 times your money, and then George coming in at fifth at 25 to 1. You know who I'm going to be rooting for this weekend. I'll be back next week, early next week, I think. I'm going to be doing a little reaction to the Stanley Cup Final with a very special guest. Look out for that. It'll be early next week. And possibly also a little reaction episode to the Canadian Grand Prix. Because Sunday I'm going to be watching, and then I kind of want to talk about it with somebody uh, come Tuesday, I'm thinking. Tuesday or Monday. We'll see how the week plays out. Thank you for being here. Could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here right now, listening or watching to this. And I appreciate you very much. I will see you next week. Take care. Good night. So long. Let's go, George. Let's go. No more porpoising. And that is how it's done. The Jesse Blake Sports Report with Jesse Blake. Powered by Sports Interaction. Canada's Sportsbook. Jesse Blake, the guy that likes to hear his name twice in one sentence. Sure, I know him. No, he doesn't have an ego at all.